Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well-being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello, gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it, Nick. Of course, of course. Welcome How are you in. doing, Nick? I am excellent. I'm excited. I'm excited for this today. Nicholas Bernadowitz. That with, would be me. With uh, Producer's Choice, of course, and Andrew Quo, Managing Director, Operations, Information, Technology, and Transitions Director. So pretty is much just everything? a hat that says jack of all trades. Yeah, you know? which I would love to get into that a little bit. because. Sure. You do more than, well, I, this is me saying, I can say this. I think you do more than most people in that organization. And that's not a knock. It's a, it's a glorification to you and how you manage all of these tasks and responsibilities at your broker dealer firm, Western International Securities. So I want to talk a little bit about how in the heck you manage all your time. I ask everybody that at the end, by the way. No, no, and, and that's a fair question. And, and ultimately, not to sound like a cliche, but you know, I have great teams around me. You know what I mean? I have a, a ton of great you know, team members that at the end of the day, you know, I mean, they, they do their jobs, mm -hmm. right? And, and really, they do most of the heavy lifting. I, I'm just kind of sitting there maybe directing traffic a little bit, but at right. the end of the day, yeah, these guys are the front line. The, you know, the teams are the front lines, and, and they're the ones kind of sitting there doing, you know, the the button pushing and, and anything else that needs to be done. I just kind of give them a little guidance and point them in the right direction. So, yeah, there's no there's no way, as you know, I could be, sit there and be at ten places at once or, or do all this stuff. I, I have to have a great supporting team around me to to help me facilitate all that. And you do it very well. It's a, like a uh, orchestra uh, conductor. Yeah. Right? yeah. Spinning the plates. Spinning the plates. Yeah, that's a, that's <laughs> a good one. I like that even better. A lot of plates spinning. Yeah. Uh, well, th thank you for coming in, spend a little time with us here, learn about you and, and talk about your firm as well as just the broker dealer, RIA space, things and trends that you're seeing and how it's evolving, which is a, an ever changing landscape we find ourselves in. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, thanks for having me. I've been, uh, you know, watching this, this particular production for a while now. You guys are doing a great job. And, you know, I'm sure the little emails and the notes that I've been sending you over the past year have been like, hey, when are you going to have me on? When are you going to have me on? Yeah. You know? And they finally... Uh, here we are. Here we are. You finally listen. You probably ran out of more interesting guests and, and probably needed to fill some space, right? Well, it's some, no, not at all. <laughs> it's just the planets need to align. You're, we're, no, you know, you're, you're, you're a busy right. guy. We're, we already said plate spinning and right. you're busy. Absolutely. Well, we probably have some listeners that don't even know what a broker dealer is within our industry. So we might want to start there. Yeah. And I guess how that distinguishes itself from an RIA, you know, what the bait, how, how, if you can, in two sentences, describe the difference, a broker dealer is based on commissions, whereas an RIA is based on, um, you know, advisory or, or fee based plot planning. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, you know, a BD is kind of the, the overall, structure, right? I mean, it's it's the one uh, centralized platform, so to speak, that, you know, sits there and houses advisors and then ultimately um, allows them and provides a platform for them to do business, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's commission or fee-based. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, RIA, similar structure, only they're more geared just to the fee-based side. Right. You know, uh, obviously different uh, regulatory bodies, uh, you know, RIAs typically don't have to deal with FINRA. Uh, they're just dealing either with state administrators or, or, or the SEC, depending on, you know, uh, their assets under management and what they're filing and everything. Like right. That. So going back a little bit, talk about your journey. You you went to college where? Cal State Fullerton. Okay, local. Yeah, local kid. Yeah. Local kid. Uh, grew up in a uh, small little desert town called Riverside. <laughs> Very small. <laughs> did you really? Yeah. No, I did. Oh, wow. I was uh, born and raised in Riverside, grew up there, went there uh, through high school. Um, you know, uh, as part of my journey, when I uh, graduated there, I went to Cal State Fullerton, which at the time, if you, I don't know if you remember, but it, it's still somewhat of a commuter school, but it was a big commuter school back then. Yeah. 
Um, you yeah, because I went to Long Beach, and okay. it's, it's same thing. Same, thing, same just thing. Yeah, different part of town. They didn't have you know dorms. They didn't have all the stuff that you see off the fifty seven right now. Mm -hmm. And and it's funny because I drive by now uh, since I'm still you know I live in your Belinda, uh, and there's just you know structures and structures of dorms and everything. So they're definitely converting more into just kind of a real college life experience, and not so much just uh just the commuter school. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so uh, went to Cal State Fullerton. So obviously I was commuting uh, for a while and uh, was a bank teller actually at uh, Union Bank. Oh, wow. Yeah, was a bank teller at Union Bank. And I remember there was an uh, advisor that would come into the bank once or twice a week and he'd come up to the tellers and he'd say, hey, as you're kind of doing transactions and taking deposits of anybody you see that has over $10,000, Refer them over to me and just let me, you know, get me a conversation with them and I'll buy you lunch. Or I'll and buy you you're dinner. like, that like, sounds great. I was like, that's sweet. <laughs> yeah, no, all I got to do, gotta do, gotta do? I got to do it anyways, right? So um, did that for a while. And then after a while, it was kind of like, I want to do what he does. I want to be the guy buying lunch. I want to be the guy, you know, having tellers and all that. What stuff. was your major? Uh, international business. So, I mean, business with an emphasis in international. So in college at the time, what was your big dream? Uh, you know, at the time it, with international business, did you want to be, Yeah, no, I wanted to kind of sit there. So I have a, a, a uncle who actually is into import exporting goods. Um, so, okay. you know, warehouse in Germany, warehouse in Taiwan and all that stuff. And so he was always kind of traveling. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to do all this stuff. Um, and I figured that was, you know, ultimately the best path for right, me to take right. to, to expedite that. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting major. You hear business all the time. You don't hear international yeah, business. Yeah, or finance, yeah, marketing, finance, what have you. Exactly. But international yeah. business, that's interesting. That's yeah. cool. No, it was, uh, and, and again, part of me was a little, it was a little self-serving because, you know, obviously international, you think, all right, well, that includes languages and all that stuff. Well, I'm already fluent in Chinese. So I was going to say, well, I'll just take the easy route. Yeah. And, and you know, use that as kind of my, my the language barrier part. You know, right. The, the language portion of it. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Okay. So you're at the bank. So I'm at the bank. And you're um, like, I want to do what that guy does. Yeah. Uh, and at the time, I was trying to figure out a way to move out of my parents' house, too. You know what I mean? And, and mm -hmm. get out of Riverside. I mean, growing up in Riverside, it's funny. You hear people, uh, you know, going to UCR and all and, and University of California, Riverside. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all coming there. I was like, I was trying to get out. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I knew I wanted to get to the beach. Yeah. So uh, an opportunity came along uh, with one of my buddies whose mom... Um, worked at a company called Financial Network, who later became ING, who is now Satera. Okay. Um, and, you know, had an opportunity to just get a job there, you know, start earning, you know, enough money to be able to pay rent and move out. So, so it, was a re it was a retail branch or was it It was, a, it was an independent broker dealer. It, it was. was the home office. Oh, oh it was yeah. right out of the gate. Right oh, out of the okay. gate. So, okay. so uh, you know, first position there, you know, just to get my foot in the door, I was in operations. I was literally matching back when there was fax machines. I was max, matching like uh, confirmation, fax confirmations with, you know, the uh, whatever was being faxed. Oh, wow. So you'd sit there and be like, all right, it said confirm, staple it to the back saying, okay, this went through, this went through. And that's literally my first job there was was matching up fax faxes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, to timestamp all the receipts of faxes yeah. that basically yeah. came in. That yeah. was so I was doing that. But again, at, at the time for me, it was a, a means to an end just to get out of, you know, something that helps you pay rent. Yeah, you know? a real job. A real job uh, while going to school. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so then, you know, fast forward, just, you know, growing up, you know, my parents, we owned uh, restaurants. So, you know, anybody who's in the restaurant industry knows that those are long days, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, luckily, you know, my, my grandma lived with us, so she kind of raises, but my parents were at work from 10 to 10. Like, right. You know, and weekends. And just weekends. Grinding. And it's just grinding. You know what I mean? So uh, so that work ethic that work was instilled ethic. in yeah, you. I think so. I think even, I mean, even subconsciously, right? Just, you know, you go in, you do your job, you bust your butt, and, uh, you know, hope, hope for good things to happen. Yeah. Right? So I did. I worked my butt off. I, I matched confirmations and I made sure that I was the guy who matched the most confirmations. And then, <laughs> you know, I uh, got another dude opening up new accounts. I would make sure I was the guy who opened up the most new accounts. Right. And so slowly and surely I was able to kind of work my way up, quote unquote, the proverbial corporate ladder. Right. 
um, until, uh, you know, the little odd ends all throughout. And then ultimately we got a, um, opportunity to be a uh, supervisor of the call center mm-hmm. because I was in the call center, but I was the guy who answered more calls than anybody else. Yeah. You know what I mean? So right. anything to draw attention. So then that was kind of my first management role was a supervisor of, of our back office call center. And you're in your twenties. At that time I was, yeah, I was 22, 23. Wow. You Just know, a baby. Just Becoming a baby. And a this supervisor. was all with the That's same great. firm? Yeah, this was still at Financial Network. Okay, okay. Uh, and then during that time, I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to be in this industry, and it seems like I, I really enjoyed it. I love the fast pace. I love the trading desk. I love just learning about this industry in general, stocks, uh, bonds, mutual funds, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so I said, well, I, I better start, you know, getting some of the credentials. So right. I started studying for my Series 7. And... Um, past you know. that and then again uh yeah you have 7 24 63 66 yeah yeah so <laughs> you know the licenses are is kind of like their uh the lifeline right i mean you need all these things to be able to do anything right um and it gives you credibility did you have to get the 24 or you chose to get the 24 the the 24 came uh after so when i was at financial network i had the 7 and the 63 uh because i wanted to maybe dabble in in the Front office sales, retail, side of it, retail side. Yeah, yeah right. Um, it's so, always it's always a tempting yeah. fruit. Yeah, to it really take is. off the tree. I mean, like I said, that was the initially my my whole reason for getting in this tree because I wanted to be that guy in the branch, right? Mm-hmm. The, the broker that came into the branch. Um, so I was at Financial Network for roughly about uh, six years. Okay, five six years, and then got an opportunity to go work at a small, you know, bank called Washington Mutual. They oh, had yeah, a, WAMU. Uh, WAMU. Yeah. So they had a uh, securities division called WM Financial. And uh, at the time, uh, I had already moved out. I was living in Huntington Beach. And their office was in Irvine. Okay. Uh, but the position at WAMU was a... Uh, did Wachovia come before WAMU or yes, after? it was before. It did. Okay. Yeah. So WAMU bought Wachovia. Correct. Got it. Correct. And then, uh, so WAMU and the position there was a, of a uh, senior business analyst slash principle. So that's part of that principle was yep. getting the 24. If that title is slapped to your name, yep. you have to have the 24. You have to have the 24, but I didn't have it at the time. Hmm. So they gave me uh, 60 days from when they hired me to get that license uh, or else, you know, I, you don't get I, the, I don't get the, like wow. I, they would let me go. What I, was I it like it. that test? I'm just curious. Um, you some. know, a lot of supervision. I mean, it was, it's obviously, I, I always say, you know, the series seven is just a grind, right? It's a, at the time it was a 300 question, six hour test that had an intermission in between. Like you would sit there for an hour and a half, do whatever. And then it makes you take a break and then come back in to take the rest of it. Wow. The 24 is, uh, you know, half of that but it's more in depth, right? Whereas the series seven is more just high level, what's a stock, what's preferred, what's an option, what's that? Correct. The 24 is more uh, supervisory principle. Why, you know, why are you looking at this? And right, and what, probably more heavy in regulation. More regulation, which, uh, what year did this rule come out? Right. And what year was this act, you know, enforced and all that stuff like that. So it was a little bit more detailed and you really had to kind of, you know, uh, memorize a lot more of the, you know, the policies and the rules and, and all mm-hmm. that stuff that, right, that right. we could supervise today. So, uh, past, you know, passed the 24, got a, uh, got a perfect score, a 70. A perfect <laughs> score. 70, that's a 70, great. you know. That's yeah. perfect. That is perfect. It's, so it's That's all the, you need. It's the pass. So then, so began my journey at WM, um, senior business analyst, and then uh, slash principal kind of got my first taste of supervision and uh, like compliance. So was that in mid 2000s, like five yeah, and six? Yeah, 2005 to 2007. In, so into the financial, whoa. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At, so and you were at WAMU? I was WAMU at, well, through. no, so, so here's, in 2007, uh, at, I had been at WAMU for a couple of years. I get a call from a, uh, a recruiter of mine uh, that I've known since that I had through college. Her name is Pat Todd, and she specializes in, in our industry. Okay. Know, people. So she called me up and she said, "Hey, there's this um, there's a small firm in Pasadena who's looking for a uh, a compliance a senior compliance uh, principal." Okay. Um, they've interviewed 17 people and, and have not 
liked any one of them or not like but just wasn't a good fit right so they haven't found the right they shoe haven't yet found the right shoe yet so they said well will you go take a look and i'm sitting i live in huntington i'm my office is in irvine like, <laughs> i'm not gonna go i'm not yeah. having out to pasadena like no right she was like just just go talk to him Please. it might be worth your while and finally so i said all right fine i took a long lunch one day and literally drove on my lunch hour to Pasadena, which, as you know, took the whole hour. Right. But, you know, I just told them, I was like, hey, I got to go run an appointment or whatever. Right. So I went there, uh, got to Western, and uh, interviewed with a guy by the name of Craig Watanabe, who is uh, kind of my predecessor there. And he was the COO slash CCO. Okay. Um, and just had a great conversation with him. Yeah. You know? and, and told him straight out, I was like, you know, you're kind of, you might be looking for someone with a lot more compliance experience, or, you know, and, and uh, someone who's, probably a little bit more qualified than I am. I had just got to 24 maybe a couple of years ago and right. really have just been was reviewing trades and reviewing accounts. Right. You know, nothing really. But we had a good conversation at Flu. We got along really well, you know, uh, and so left there not thinking anything of it going, all right. Well, then I get a call back literally two days later from him saying, hey, the CEO, Don Bizzub, uh, I would like you to come in to meet with him. Okay. Okay. So I took another long lunch. <laughs> drove <in laughs> drove all mind. the way. Uh, came in and spoke with Don. And, you know, anybody who knows Don, and, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners at one point, you know, have come, easiest guy to talk to, right? I mean, mm -hmm. literally we sat there and talked about, you know, probably talked a little bit about the position, but in, moreover, we talked about poker, we talked about video games, we talked, we just had a great conversation. Yeah. Um, and literally they, they offered me the job on the spot. And second interview. Second interview. Wow. Don did, uh, or they John and they they did. Craig, oh, okay. Craig and Don. oh, it was the meeting. Okay, um, and it was you know it, the conversation was so. So good this was oh seven. This was oh seven. It was okay. Yeah. Okay. So how big was Western at that time in, oh, in terms of how many reps? Uh, at the time, I think maybe we had, they had uh, ninety, a hundred. Okay. You know, not not huge, but you know, definitely was uh, you know kind of at the beginning. So of course, you know, they offered me a position, definitely gave me something to think about. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, am I really gonna leave a national brand right. at the time, like WAMU, right. to go work for, you know, a, quote, a boutique right. firm in Pass and the commute. But, um, you know, at, at that time I, I saw and I heard something that definitely made me feel like, okay, they're building something here. Mm -hmm. uh, culture, people, like I just, I felt that it was something that if I can get in kind of on the ground floor, it, it might be worthwhile. Right. So I did it. I, I left uh, WAMU, told them, and, and started as the senior uh, compliance you know, analyst or principal at Western International. Okay. So then obviously there the for, within the first year, the credit crisis happens, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, banks start getting, you know, swallowed up by bigger banks. And WAMU, as you know, went out of business. Their subprime kind of blew them up. And, right. and I'm just sitting there thinking, holy crap, you know, um, a lot of my coworkers that was at WAMU are out of jobs. Out of jobs. Yeah, you know. Um, that could have easily been you. It could have easily been me. Yeah. And, and at the time, I'm sitting there thinking, well, I cashed in my, my, you know, 401, my stock options and all that stuff, thinking I just took a bath on it. But it luckily, was a it, it was a blessing because <laughs> yeah. literally a lot of people lost it. And here you are. And here I am. And and 15 years later. Yeah. <laughs> so how did, uh, um, you know, I mean, and it's been a growth story yeah. of WIS yeah. ever since. But I imagine there was probably some turbulent times getting through those few years. Well, you know, it was tough. Uh, just speaking of the, the whole 2008 credit, you know, crunch place. You know, we weren't, at the time, we were, uh, our main clearing firm was Bear Stearns. You know, wow. so, uh, you know, we weren't like nobody knew what was going to happen. Um, and so I, I remember we ended up kind of having to scramble one weekend and, and signing a um, an agreement with with Pershing mm -hmm. as a clearing firm. Right. Just in case, you know, because we just had no idea. Right. I mean, fortunate Monday, they announced JP Morgan was going to take Bear Stearns. And, and that actually ended up working out you know, in our favor. Right. But um, but yeah, there was just so much uncertainty then, and and that was a very scary time because we just you just didn't know what was going to happen. You didn't know which bank was going to be there left standing. Right. When the dust settled. When the dust settled, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. Amazing. So it, it was it was a crazy time. I remember there was a uh, 
Indy Mac Bank. I don't know if you remember that. Oh one. yeah, I had buddies work for him. We, yeah. we were in Orange County. Yeah, you, everybody was knew that? someone that worked for Indy Mac. Yeah, I remember there was a uh, there was their a branch across the street from our Pasadena office right now, and I remember just coming into work and seeing people lined up across around the block. Oh man, to try to get in because they were you know freaking yeah. out about losing their losing their money and, and yeah. being able to withdraw. Yeah, that was a crazy time. Sidebar comment. I, I remember I bought my first condo in Huntington. Okay. And over on Beach and Adams. Oh. And I paid two fourteen nine for it. Wow. Which was like, wow, this is a lot of money. Yeah. You know? And uh I had a mortgage for world savings. My buddy at IndyMac ended up buying it from me four years later for four twenty eight or something like that. Nice. All, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And obviously he lost it, you know, because <laughs> right. it ended up just going completely the opposite direction. He lost his job. And, you know, you had so many of those stories of just this. It was funny money. It was a house of cards. It was is what it cards. was. Right. You had, you had people out of high school buying million dollar homes at the time. You know what I mean? They, they had a bunch of different structured loans and flex arms and all that yeah, stuff. It was, that, it, ATM. Know, ATM. Yeah. You know, it was crazy. Well, you should have, you know, we should have probably known, obviously hindsight, but probably should have known when you had 18 year olds driving around Ferraris because <laughs> they were sitting there mortgage there as a mortgage lender, right. a mortgage broker. Yeah. You know I mean? Boats so, and toys boats and everything and toys, else. Yeah. You know, I, I would say financially things are much more sound today, Yeah. <clears throat> but the valuation of things are similar in the sense that it's just gone completely haywire. A um, little inflated little inflated, of course. I mean, I, I was reading an article, you know, inflation, they're saying real inflation is somewhere between 8 and 10% right now. Wow. That's incredible. That can't be sustainable. Yeah. Um, I think things will settle down, but there's so much money out there through the PPP loans, through... It's interesting, you should run into businesses now, and there's certain businesses that are seem to be printing money. Yeah. And then there's other businesses who are still continuing to really challenge themselves. It, it's a very polarizing time we find ourselves in and it's cheap to borrow right i mean it's pretty much like you said it's free right now totally I mean, it's the the interest rates and the rates where they are right now i mean it, it's very appealing and it's like those promotional things when you go and buy like a fridge or mattress right it's like first two years zero apr zero yeah. interest and it's same as cash <laughs> kind of type deal it's pretty much you know kind of similar to that right now you know so on that note i imagine a part of a part of the the wis <coughs> journey has been through i mean there's so much you know, M and A's uh, acquisitions going on and consolidation of both broker dealers, mm -hmm. RIA firms, but also independent advisor practices. I mean, you've got an aging population yep. with with cheap money. I imagine this has been a real catapult for where we are today because you're seeing businesses being purchased in the financial services space every day. And I know that you a big part of you know WIS's growth has been through that that strategy of acquisitions and and taking in what you would classify as these OS, small OSJs or small independent BDs and yep. and that's been very successful as a growth strategy. Yeah, you know, for for our standpoint, you know, the term I use is you know we we never really um, our business model never really had a farm system. You know, we didn't bring guys in get them licensed and train them how to be an advisor. Right. Um, our growth has always been, you know, what I say is, you know, filling a leaky bucket, right? Like with just more advisors, we'd bring established advisors, we'd sit there and acquire small independent broker dealers that may or may not want to be, you know, in the industry anymore. They're looking to fold and, and then we would take on them and their advisors. So mm -hmm. that's kind of always been our growth is always just adding new blood as opposed to kind of sitting there and, and growing organically from within. Right. So we said in 07, 75, 90 reps, something yep. like that. Yep. Now, where do we sit WIS? So WIS right now has uh, about 580. Okay. Wow. Um, and, and I will tell growth. you in 2008, when all the consolidation was happening with, uh, you know, Merrill and Bank of America and, and what and WAMU and whatever, um, that was probably one of our best years in recruiting hmm. and recruiting because what was happening was because of the uncertainty, you know, a lot of the advisors that joined us came from these wire houses because, you know, it became those names almost became like a hindrance. Mm -hmm. It became a negative thing. Now they were attached to these names that were either going out of business or getting consolidated 
And so mm-hmm. this was their opportunity to kind of sit there and separate themselves from from those labels, from those, those labels. brands. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, I think we added 130 advisors to in that wow. year, 2008. Wow. Yeah, it was, uh, it was it was crazy. So how did you handle that kind of growth? You know, it, it was uh, a lot of you know it was a lot of hiring and scrambling and bringing aboard more resources and then looking which kind of served us really well was we started relying more on, okay, let's work smarter, not harder. Let's start looking into kind of technology and workflows and things that can kind of help us make, uh, be more efficient. Yeah. Cause Don is very, you know, technically in tune. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so at the time the organizational structure was how deep, I mean, how many people were on the, uh, I would say at the time we had, uh, maybe, 18 to 20 people okay. total across okay. the board. And that's including trading, ops, compliance, accounting, you know. Um, so definitely, yeah. So and, we, and today the team is? The, two, the team is roughly 80. Okay. Today. Yeah. Uh, with a couple of people remote and a couple of people in the Pasadena office and, and, and whatnot. So and I imagine over time that part of that has been just the continued demand of, of compliance and suitability and oversight. That's and, exactly what it was. Yeah. You know, I mean, technology takes you so far, but at the end of the day, you still need someone to push the buttons <laughs> on the technology. You know what I mean? Would you start a broker dealer today? No. 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 I, I probably should have hesitated a little bit. More I was just having, <laughs> cause I was just having this conversation yesterday um, actually with an advisor who, who established a, a, an independent RIA firm and doing yeah. very, very well. Right. But, acknowledge that one of the continued headwinds that they're running up against is in their development of, of, of advisor recruitment, still having to deal with advisors who may have legacy assets or, or a residual amount of, of broker dealer need, Mm -hmm. even though the shift since DOL has been more advisory, advisory, advisory. And so, you know, what, what do you say about that and where we're at today? Yeah, no, absolutely. Good point. Um, I definitely see the business kind of shifting a little bit more towards the the RIA space, mm-hmm. um, you know, fee based, uh, you know. But to your point, I don't think it's ever going to go 100 percent that way. I think there's always still going to be a BD, a broker dealer need. need for for commission business because truth of the matter is, fee based doesn't necessarily work for everybody. Right. You know what I mean? Um, every household, you know. You, 75% of their accounts might qualify for fee base, but then you have, you know, the kids' upmas, the 529s, and, you know, accounts like that that, you know, doesn't necessarily fall in that fee base realm. So you yeah. kind of have to have both. You kind of have to have that hybrid, I believe. Even though major- more of it is shifting uh, towards the fee base RIA model, um, I, I definitely think, I don't think that's ever going to go, the broker dealer commission bait. That's never going to always 100% go away. It, and not that, you know, support. there's the whole world of alts, which you could go down, you know, that, yeah. that rabbit hole, and it could lead you into many different directions. Historically, as a firm, you, you've had quite a number of advisors who were really specialists in, in alts and dealing with 1031 exchanges and some of these other situations. Not that they don't also, they can also exist in the advisory mo- world. They, they predominantly haven't. Haven't. No. They uh, a lot of these new uh, alternative investment firms, as time has gone on, they've they've realized kind of where the paradigm shift is going, and have created you know advisory class options for right. their offering. Yeah. But majority of it is still falls under the the broker dealer commission world. Um, but you know, from our standpoint, I mean. We, you know, our bread and butter has never really been alts. It's never, it's our bread and butter for Western has always been more equity stock trades. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And and obviously in order to kind of keep up with the Joneses, we had to uh, offer a lot of these alternative products and everything. But, you know, it's still a fairly small part of our business. I'd say less than, less than 5% of really? our overall revenue is generated it's, from alternative. Wow. Yeah. From alternatives. Now, but, but <clears throat> from, from a revenue model mm-hmm. of commissions versus advisory, uh, what where, where are you at today and and uh, I I'd say you know it's it's again it's shifted to probably 60 40 fee based versus commissions at this okay. point uh, definitely not you know totally lopsided one way or the other yet but it's you know it's 60 40 coming from 50 50 coming from so you know, seeing 40, it shifting seeing the other it way shift the other way okay. Yeah, okay. As, as more and more advisors are are you know talking to their clients and and getting those assets moved over to. Do you also see a big difference in the, you know, the makeup of the advisor in, in their choosing of model? I guess younger advisors would definitely lend themselves probably more towards advisory 
where some of the older advisors would be more commission based? Oh yeah, um, yeah. definitely. You know, and that's just kind of part of the evolution of the of the business and the industry, right? You have guys that have been in the industry for 30, 40 years. You know, fee based wasn't that big a, a big thing back then. They have mainly a you know stockbroker trades. commission trades, and that's how they generate. And as you know, the the demographic of advisors that have joined us gotten younger. Yeah. Um, you know, they're growing up in a business where they're hearing about RIAs and fee-based and, you know, hey, this is what you want to get into. So the the guys that have been in there for a long time, they're kind of struggling a little bit to catch up, right? They're trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I reinvent myself or my business to, to switch over to this fee-based? Yeah. But the newer guys, which are a little bit younger that maybe don't have as much time in the industry, that's kind of how they're growing up learning the business. Yeah. And also, I think the consumer shift, <clears throat> maybe we could talk a little bit about just the, the shifting of being a broker <clears throat> to being r- tr- truly a financial planner and not just anecdotally right. saying that I am, yep. but really living and breathing and executing in that regard. And, you know, we talk about the five pillars of financial planning. Well, how do I implement that? Right. And, and maybe an example of an advisor or two that's, that you can refer to that are doing that. Sure. No. And, and that's kind of one of the things that, uh, and, and I know you and Scott and Nick and, and myself have been talking about probably for the past five years, right? We have. Is the, um, is how to get, how to educate our advisors and some of these uh, guys that are quote unquote labeled themselves as stockbrokers to right. be more financial planners, wealth managers. Um, and what it comes down to is it's, it's, it's almost, you know, self-preservation for them, right? They need to be able to sit there and offer everything under the sun to their clients, um, <clears throat> whether it's securities, uh, you know, insurance, banking, whatever. The goal is to consolidate everything under one umbrella because any piece of that that you're allowing someone else to do, yeah, I can promise you that person might have a Series 7 or might have a partner who has a Series 7 that are sitting there trying to trying to sit there and take those assets away from Correct. You, right? Yeah. So the more piece of the pie that you're able to sit there and manage and control, the less likelihood that a, a sliver or a slice gets accidentally given away to someone else who might be trying to take the rest of the pie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's an interesting conversation too. It's like, <clears throat> if I'm really building relationships with clients today, I think the demand and the hunger is there to provide my full family wealth solution. Yep. So what are my family dynamics? Who are my children? Uh, are there at-risk children due to their profession? Or, you know, do you have the, we joke about, uh, uh, Jeff uses the, you know, the seller dweller son yeah. or child. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, you know, those are important conversations that advisors should take, go the extra mile and have those conversations with their clients because that does shape how I manage their investments and income and all those other facets of the the big the, the puzzle. One of the things too, you know, if you're gonna claim to be a, a true holistic financial planner and I'm gonna, you know, offer everything to my clients, you need to have access to that. Yep. And if you're on a, a captive agency or you're just selling stocks or trades, right, you can't claim to be a true financial planner, right? Or a holistic planner with the five pillars. If you can't offer insurance to your clients, are you truly doing what's in their best interest? Are you being a true fiduciary to those clients? Mm. And that's always a problem we see is people are like, no, I'm, I'm a fiduciary. Well, are you offering everything to these clients and truly planning for them? Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, now you guys know better than I do with, you know, when you have a book of business and you have a client you know, that person or that husband and wife isn't just your client, but you got to think next generation, right? Mm -hmm. You need to sit there and and start planning because if something happens, you need to make sure that these kids or the heirs or the beneficiaries know that, hey, you're here and and that they don't, you know, sit there and try to move the money away from you because they trust you. They know you. They know, you know, the people before them trusted you. Yeah. You kind of have to build that relationship down, down generation lines too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it's an interesting conversation, just how the, <clears throat> the consumer drives certain behaviors and more than ever, financial planning is, is progressing itself into being a, an experience. What is the experience that I, as the advisor, am going to provide my clients and how, I'm go- how am I going to solve all their needs 
to, to provide them true wealth right. in retirement. Right. And you have certainly some advisors that epitomize that um, through this experience. I want to shift to talking about one of the roles that you've done within the firm. And, you know, class act, we've talked about this, you know, the home office having a look and a feel and a culture and hopefully that that is inbred and pushed through the rest of the culture of the organization, but also through specific experience through your event up in Lake Tahoe, which is just an intimate event. And then, of course, historically, your big conference in Terranea and the speakers and little things like everybody gets a nice polo shirt. And it's important. reason I bring that up is because so many people are hungry for experiences today more than ever, right. even as we work through these challenges of the pandemic and all of that. And do you have any advisors that are using experiences, or whether it's in person or whether that's digital, that come to mind? Yeah, no, you know, our our um, our kind of motto has always been, you know, the, the one thing we always say is the only reason we exist is to delight our customers. And who's our customers? Well, it's the it's the advisor. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, we don't treat them like employees. We don't treat them like, um, you know, independent contractors. We treat them like customers. And, you know, how do you treat customers? Well, they're always right, yeah. you know, to some extent. Um, well, and the word family is thrown around all the time at these we events. Don't, we don't call, you know, we don't have employees. We have team members. Right. You know, we don't have departments. We have teams. Right. And, uh, and again, our advisors are our customers. And the only reason we exist is to delight the customer, yeah. right? And, you know, you hear delight. It's like, all right, well, is that kind of cheesy? Well, yes and no, because our goal is to provide a, an experience for every single time we have an interaction as an opportunity to, to delight them, is to provide an experience or where they can leave that saying, wow, that was, that was great. I didn't get the answer I wanted, but you know what? It was great talking to Andrew. It was great talking to Linda. It was great, you know, it, you can deliver any message in a way that still makes people walk away feeling that, you know, they had a great experience. Right. To go back to your other question as far as, you know, what I'm seeing with some of these advisors and whatnot. Yeah, no, we have a lot of advisors that have kind of adopted the, we call the WIS way, right? Right. Um, <clears throat> providing a, a, an experience to their customers, you know. Uh, you know Andrew Martz, Bill McBride, they, they've been on the show before. Yeah. You know, prime examples of, people who have really embraced the WIS culture, um, you know, to the extent where they're, you know, providing the experience that they feel that we would do in the home office, right? Whether it's the, the upscale office, um, the gifts, the, um, you know, just the, the overall general interaction, the way right. they market themselves, you know, for, for the longest time, they were, uh, you know, calling themselves WIS advisors, right? right. I mean, the, they actually use that as, as their kind of, um, you know, marketing point that they went out to everybody and tried to, because they wanted to model kind of what we did at WIS or what we're doing at WIS. Right. Um, feeling that that was kind of how you attract the high-end customers. And that was how you sit there and, you know, yeah, we might not be a household name like a Morgan Stanley or, or a UBS or whatever, but, you know, Andrew Martz and Bill McBride Financial – or, or WIS advisors, you know, we provide the same upscale experience um, that that the, all these other big banks can. Yeah, you think about just that <clears throat> that process and what's required there is, you know, building an independent brand and executing in regards yeah. to a website and how you want to communicate to consumers, what experience you want them to feel when they look at you, not just in person but online and mm -hmm. and and more advisors need to embrace that as they move forward. Yeah, it's tough. You know what I mean? Especially if you're coming from a, uh, a bank or a wirehouse model and going independent for the Which first time. Which they do all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. so they they manage the office space. They provide you an assistant. They do all this stuff for you. But when you go independent, you're pretty much opening up and starting a small business, mm -hmm. right? 100%. Um, and a lot of the things that you normally didn't have to worry or think about you know, is now all of a sudden in your face that you have to figure out, right? You yeah. have to uh, figure out about hiring staff. You got to get office space. You got to get um, technology. You got to buy a computer. Yeah. Um, and so, the, you know, that's one of the things that we, we did also was uh, kind of, we have what's called a turnkey model, mm -hmm. um, which basically is what it sounds like. It's a turnkey plug and play 
an advisor can come from day one, step in, and he'll have an office, he'll have a virtual assistant, he'll have a computer, he'll have telephones, and ultimately it's located in an office where there's support staff there that, that can kind of help and guide him so that all he needs to worry about is his client interactions, bringing assets over, recruiting new assets, uh, and, and leave the other stuff kind of to us to worry about. Yeah. You know? And that's part of that experience I'm telling you about, right? That's the experience that we don't want them worrying about paperwork. We'll handle the paperwork. Yeah, there's a very important part of every advisor's career where they come to a crossroads and the crossroads forces them to decide whether they're an income producer right. or they're going to be a business builder. Because if I'm going to be a business builder and go with the independent model, well, that means I need to wear all the hats. Yep. I have to build the brand. I have to do my payroll. I have to do the execution with client relationships. I've got to hire people, train people. I've got to build a business yeah. as opposed to knowing that I'm just a really good advisor and I want to keep my head down and work directly with clients and let everything else off to the experts. Exactly. And that's the turnkey model. Yes. Yeah. It's very smart. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's worked out well. Um, and, and, you know, even if it's quote unquote short term, right? I mean, the goal with this turnkey was that, okay, these guys would come and maybe bounce around in the turnkey for a few years until mm -hmm. they get their feet on the ground, get stable. And, but we've been able to provide such an, a great experience for them that there's like, well, why, why would I change? Right. I mean, everything's working great. My business is growing. I'm not having to worry. I don't have the headaches. Um, why change? I can and, do what I do best. I can do what I do best. Like you mentioned, yeah. you know, they yeah. they figured out that my time is best spent dealing with my clients, mm -hmm. going out there and growing my book and growing my practice. The people within the WIS family, not just home office, but all the reps, and Scott and I have talked about this, are, are pleasant people to talk to. Mm -hmm. We have yet to talk to an advisor who is a jerk, who is a person that blows you off. They, it, it is truly a family and pleasant people to work with, even on our side, right, where they're getting bombarded by people like us in the insurance world or any wholesaler, really. Yeah. So it, it's been, it, it truly shows some of that cultural shift that you guys have built within the WIS network. That culture is there and it, it is an experience driven culture. Yeah. Our, our goal has always been from hiring a, uh, you know, we don't call her a receptionist. We call her the uh, VP of first impressions, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, but, you know, our goal has always been, you know, we just want to work with friendly people. We yeah. want to work with nice people. I can train anybody to do anything, but I can't train them, you know, not to be an, an a-hole. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. we look for nice people. We look for intelligent, nice people, professional people. And then, again, at the, and then once they're there, we can have them and train them to do whatever it is that, you know, we want them to do. We're a very, you know, employee-centric firm, right? We, yeah. we find what people like to do and what they're good at and try to you know, put them in the position because they're going to be happy. And yeah. they're gonna be, if they're happy, then they're going to make our customers happy, which in turn, you know, hopefully makes them more productive and not have to worry about, you know. Yeah. I mean, the culture is certainly refreshing. <clears throat> There's no question of that. And that's kudos, I think, to everybody from the bottom all the way up to the top. <clears throat> now, change is constant. Yep. Evolution is... Yep. And with the recent acquisition of with Atria, though, I I wonder how do you maintain the same culture? You know, I mean, fortunate for us, you know, Atria came and, you know, they shared a lot of the same values. And okay. I can tell you that with you know one hundred percent certainty that you know when I'm dealing with the leadership and, and personnel at Atria, you know, we speak the same language, so right. to speak. Right? Their number one you know, uh, concern is to make sure that the customer has a great experience, right? With, with you know, the, their technology, this Unio system that they're building, which is, you know, kind of a one-stop shop. It's a proprietary system that they built literally from the ground up. It's a one-stop shop that literally encompasses, you know, their, their back office, their CRM, their quotes, their everything, and into one, you know, one shell. But that was built you know, basically from the ground up with the advisor in mind. Okay. And, and providing them that you know, experience that would put them kind of um, above and beyond, you know, what they might be able to find independently or, or, or in a la carte. Right, right. right. There. You know what I mean? Yeah, piecemeal and um, splice all this together. It yeah. becomes so 
confusing. Yeah, no, we're on, uh, I'm on a call, you know, once or twice a week with, with all of them. And, and first thing they're doing is, okay, what's, you know, how fast are we answering the phones? How quickly are we getting things done? Um, are we engaging with these clients? And when, you, when we are engaging, you know, how well are we doing? They, mm-hmm. they have metrics for everything. And all of them steer towards and point towards what the experience is that, that they're providing. So we're fortunate that, you know, we had a parent company now right. that shared the same values. And, and I think ultimately that's, you know, once you have that down, you can kind of build from that, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to lose advisors that are happy. Right. Of where, of where they are. Yeah. So going forward, do you see with that uh, an opening for accelerating growth? Or are we getting to some kind of a maturation no, in terms of no. the growth No, I curve? mean, our, our goal is, uh, it's funny, you talk to Don and, and, you know, you ask him what his plan was and it's always, you know, the same line, total world domination. Right. <laughs> that's like <laughs> our, um, and, yeah, that's right? that ours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but that doesn't change. If anything, you know, with Atria now being able to help support and the resources that they provide right. and, and you know, the infrastructure and everything that they have, now we're just able to accelerate that growth. Yeah, it's because, a catalyst. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so, no, nothing has changed. Our, our plan is still total world domination. But, you know, with the help of Atria, it will expedite all that. One advisor at a time. One advisor at a time, or, you know, maybe 60 advisors at a time, depending on the firm that we bring on board or acquire, you know, all that stuff, nothing changed. Our business model never changed. That's great. And and WIS lives on. The name lives on. The whole brand continues as... Yeah, WIS is still uh, its own entity. Yep. Uh, Independent broker dealer is still... You know, Atria, uh, even though they acquired us, they're just the parent company. They're the holding company. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're not a broker dealer themselves. They, they're a holding company that owns a series of, of broker dealers such as Western. Yeah. So they could put gasoline on the fire and oh, yeah. just accelerate it yep. through resources, money, all, all of that. Yeah, deeper pockets, more resources, better, yep. you know, technology, infrastructure, you know, and, and it's nice to be honest with you. Uh, you yeah. know, and we had, I told you, we have roughly about 80 people working, you know, Atria has hundreds and thousands, you know, thousand people. Right, you know, right. And, and, one head, you know, two two heads are better than one, and well, a thousand is better than eighty. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I want to shift now because I think you're the perfect person to talk about this because you were intimately involved in this, I'm sure, for many years and probably still are. At Terranea, yeah. you know, main conference. There's always a keynote speaker. Yeah. The one I went to last one yeah. was Terry Bradshaw. That's right. TB. So so not 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 that he's the example, but the question is this: having that intimate experience in selection and the choosing of professional speakers to your audience are there any presenters over the years that just really stood out and uh maybe some that little challenging or you know how did you ultimately decide who the speakers are and uh you know from our standpoint when we were kind of sitting there putting together an event and choosing the content and keynotes and all that stuff you know our goal every single year was all right well we want the advisor, the customer to leave that saying, that was the best event I've ever been to, mm-hmm. All right? So if that's our goal every year, and then also our goal internally was, we want to top what we did last year, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? So, you know, who's going to be good this year? Oh, that was great. Okay, so who can we get next year now to top that? Right. And that's our, always been our goal. Raise I mean, the bar. Raise the bar mm-hmm. and raise the bar. Crank it up to 11, mm-hmm. right? Um, that's always our number one goal is always doing better and always learning from from our, you know, past, not mistakes, but just past experiences. Mm -hmm. And how do we make that better for the next one? So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, TB, uh, you know, fortunately we were able to do that before the pandemic, obviously, but, um, you know, going forward now we have to figure out who we're going to sit there to, to get to top Terry Bradshaw. You know what I mean? And it just depends on kind of where the industry is. You know, we kind of ebbs and flows and we're always looking for trends, what's happening, you know, right now. Yeah, the tone, trying the tone, to gauge the yeah, tone. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we've had some great economists, um, you know, uh, Yuri and Timmers from who is a, a well-renowned uh, economist from Fidelity, right? He was great. Um, we had, uh, you know, one of the analysts from Wedbush who covers, you know, Amazon and Apple and, uh, and his name slips me right now, but. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know, it just, just kind of depends on where we are in the industry yeah. and, and kind of what's happening around us. And we're very conscious of making sure that we're bringing things that not just bring in a name, yeah. but bring in somebody who can sit there and, and add 
and, and talk about something that's relevant. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You see a personality. We'll wrap up here uh, on TV and the persona. But then when you get them just on an intimate stage, and it, relatively speaking, it's an intimate stage yeah. when you're not having millions of viewers and on set, right? Yeah. And um, I thought it was a very informative, just insightful speech and presentation, but he got so sweaty. Oh man, he was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was a warm, humid day. I remember, and yeah. they, you know, there was what, 300 bodies in that room. Right. And yeah, no, by the time under the spotlight, by the time he got off stage, he came and, and I actually came gave him a hug him. Right. and he looked like he had just jumped in a pool. Yeah, he you know, was so and just covered full workout. With sweat, full yeah. workout. Yeah, he looked like he was just. When you're on point and presenting, it it's, it's hard. It's yeah, it is. It's tough. So kudos to him. It's tough. So we should wrap up with the the question that you always ask is how does how does Andrew Quo manage his time and keep his sanity within life, family? What's what's your me time? What's your 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 personal strategy to handle Especially it all. with how we started, where <clears throat> within your profession, uh -huh. you're pulled in so many yep. directions. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and at the end of the day, it's, you know, controlling the things that I can control, you know, and, and knowing that there are just going to be things that, you know, that that's out of my control. And and fortunate for me, you know, and, and you know, I know you guys are in the same boat, you know, my, my important thing is knowing that I get to go home and see my family and, and my wife and my kids, right? A 10 and an eight year old. Um, they kind of keep me grounded, you right. know? Uh, you know, I come home and, and I try not to bring it with me because, <laughs> you know, kids can sense that, yeah. right? They sense the stress, they sense the anxiety and all that stuff. So, you know, I try to leave it at the door. Um, you, one thing I would say, which I wear on my face, yeah. You don't seem to wear stress at all. Well, I hide it well. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And, yeah. And, and how do you do it, that? Well, you know, Good part of it player. is, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. Um, no, I, I just try to hide it because I know that, you know, my mood will affect my team's mood or uh, my mood will affect my wife's mood and my kid's mm -hmm. mood. You know, I don't want them to, I, I still love the fact that I walk in the door and they're just, dead. Yeah. I don't want him to, you know, I walk to the door and they look at me and say, Oh, geez, he's in yeah. a bad mood. Right. No, that's just not the impression I want to make. So no. a lot of it is masking and hiding it, which can be hard at times. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know what? It's, I don't, I don't like the term. It's just a job because it's more than just a job. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something that I think everybody in this room agrees, you know, we're in the minority because we wake up in the morning excited to get it to mm -hmm. work. We're excited to see each other. We're excited to sit there and see what the day brings, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is me. I yeah. love what I do. And yeah. yeah, I mean, anything worth doing is, is going to be difficult at times, Yeah, but I love it. You right. know, I love talking to you guys. I love talking to our partners. I love talking to our advisors. And my goal is that even if it's over the phone, they can hear, they can hear my smile over the phone. You yeah. know what I mean? I, I want to make sure I present that because it makes it a lot more difficult for people to be mad at you or to yell at you when they, <laughs> when they know that, <laughs> You're just a happy guy smiling on the other end, right? I mean, let's face it. Yeah. My first real job was in construction. And for me, that was a job. Yeah. Getting up and grinding. It was a grind, And right? working. Yeah. It, I mean, nothing but kudos and compliments to those that can do that day in oh. and day out. But I say this because I tell everybody, you know, I, in, when I found this space and yeah. what we do, I've never felt that I have... I work up, wake up and have to go to a job. Right. I love what we do. Yep. I love who we serve and our why is fulfilling for me. Yep. And so because of that, I don't have that feeling of this has got to, I'm putting my pants on and I got to go to this job. That's a blessed place to be. I, I hope everybody can find that in their life. Absolutely. They and, deserve and, that, if nothing else. But, you know, like anything else, you know, there are going to be times that things are hard. Yeah. You know, being a dad is hard. Being yeah. a husband is hard. Marriage is, you know, it's hard. It's hard to, you know, sit there and plan a family vacation. There's going to be hard points. Yeah. And you just have to sit there and roll with it. So roll what's your punches. outlet? How do you release stress? And when do you find the time to do that? Uh, you know, I run a lot. You do. So, you know. I'm sitting there probably so averaging God. averaging like uh, Honors. three, four miles a day, probably five days a week. Really? I run Ooh. a lot. First thing? Uh, no. Or whenever? After, right when I get home. So, you do? Uh, we've been, oh, that is your outlet. That is my outlet on a day-to-day -day basis. We uh, we kind of, during the pandemic, 
you know, we built kind of an in-house gym, you know. Of right course, bench. everybody so did. Everybody did, you know, yeah. you, you, you yeah. did. Um, you know, so that we can continue, you know, because that was important. It was, yeah. you know, having that outlet. And believe it or not, you know, running is a great stress reliever. Because, Always outdoor or did you, you ever know, do? So we have a treadmill and then Peloton? Uh, it's a Peloton. And then ultimately the Peloton the, um, tread, the tread. You do. There was a recall on that. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, no, if you have, you have, uh, the you bike. Have a bike, right? I have the bike. But we can yeah. find each other. I can't other run. Way. No. Why is I that? mean, I can, yeah. but in short distances. See, I can't I'm ride a, a bike. I'm, like I can ride you a can. bike, but that's, I don't not like your thing. Not my thing. I'm yeah, a okay. runner. I've always been a runner. Um, but you know, I live in your Belinda where there's a lot of hills and a lot of pretty scenery and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So like the other day, you know, uh, since it was kind of nice and it wasn't 180 degrees outside, I actually right. ran outside in the hills and stuff like that. That's but nice. Running has always been a great outlet for me. Uh, golfing is a great outlet for me. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, yeah. just kind of find stuff that makes you happy. Okay. Yeah. Functional. You move weight. Uh, yeah, I try to a little okay. bit, not as much. I'm more cardio. You yeah, know, okay. more, more of it is yeah. just long, long, athletic person like you. Not, not thinking, just kind of staying, you know, yeah. Handsome. Well, well like I got to be, get bigger like you though, buddy. Like, you know, push-ups, right? push-ups, no, push-ups right. squats and deadlifts, right? Basically. No, I've seen some and of your, pull-ups. I've seen some of your, uh, your workouts. I'm sitting there going, geez, I'll, I'll just run. Right. <laughs> I can just put my shoes on, I headphones put my shoes on. Headphones and just zone out. You got to actually worry about weights falling on your head and dropping them on your foot and stuff. Calluses and all that stuff. <laughs> That's great. It's good. It, it, yeah. It's it's how we relieve our stress. It's how we relieve. Yep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everybody and find needs balance the as best we can. Everybody yep. needs the outlet. Thank but you. Again, no, thank Time you. Time flies. No, it does fly. And and again, I appreciate you guys having me on. This was, this was fun. Um, and again, I, I appreciate your guys' partnership. I mean, you guys, it's funny because, uh, and I know you were closing up, but uh, it's funny how one phone call from, do you remember you joined us, came from us from the FWG mm-hmm. position. That's right. And I remember. Uh, Who is this character? Yeah. He was like, called me up and introduced <laughs> yourself. And I was like, okay. And then, at, and you know, we were, you were persistent. We got together, we talked, we hit it off. And, yeah. and, you know, who would have known that that one phone call out of the blue. Right. Uh, it would develop into you guys being, you know, one of our, our more important strategic partners and ultimately our, our I'd, I'd say, our main kind of in, insurance IMO broker. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And yeah. I feel like we, <clears throat> in any of these relationships, it's so much more progress that can be done and yeah. and to continue to aspire and raise the bar, yep. using that as an example, and just provide value not only for those within the firm at the executive level, but the family within. And if we can make any difference in their lives and be an extension of their office. That's the ultimate goal. And you nailed it right there. You guys are, I think of you guys as an extension of WIS without, you know, sitting there tromping all over your guys' name and label, Mm -hmm. you know, by de facto, you know, part of the WIS family as our practice management insurance. That's the goal. Yep. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Until next time. Nick, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment or review. Be sure to check us out on social media at Optimized Advisor Podcast. Till next time.